This program was made possible by a grant from the Independent Documentary Fund, which is supported by the National Endowment for the Arts and the Ford Foundation. La la. La, la. La, la. la la. And this is a, a wonderful documentary which gives just a whole variety of, of, of people who, who come from all over or were, who were here. Making it making in it, LA. Making it, making it in making LA. It in LA. LA. A, a chance to show how different we are, but, but how much we are the same, and, and how, if you have a dream, you can uh, come here and uh, keep dreaming. <laughs> My name is Jadine Barber. I'm an actress. I came to L.A. about 15 years ago. I came, I came to meet my real father and my sisters and brothers. And I hated New York. Oh, God, did I hate New York. All the energy on the street, I couldn't take it. So I thought L.A. was laid back. Perfect for me. The New York actors are really coming in here. I don't know what the percentage is, but I hear all kinds of things about how many are coming in daily. I think I spent uh, eight years in New York always coming to certain points in time where I said, well, if I don't get a job by January, I'll go to L.A. Whenever I go to interviews, I'm always hearing these people. Uh, they, they seem to all know each other. It's like a club. It's like they're alumni or something. And I got here, and I thought I was... I thought I was in Nirvana. Every agent I called up said, sure, great, fabulous, come in, I can't wait to meet you. You'll see one actor go, um, uh, hey, Joe, hi, how are you? How long have you been out here? I thought I had really arrived, I had made the best decision of my life, until I realized that that was their way of saying no thank you. How are you taking it, and uh, have you been back? Have you been back? And it's like, they, they don't even announce that it's New York, but you know that it is. But the thing about Los Angeles is that you can do I mean, you can do one day's work and, and make as much money as, as you make in a week. And pretty soon, the whole group is all talking about New York. And I really can't join in on this because I don't know what they're talking about. But it seems like everything is much better back there. Or if you even walk down a street on Times Square, you eventually run into at least 10 or 15 people that you know. There's an exchange of ideas and a flow of information and a really good kind of feeling of energy that you're in this all together. Here, you're really isolated. So my feeling is that the California person sitting there looking at them is, I think, if things are so great back there, what made you come out here? I came out here to get in the picture business because I'd heard that there was a terrible shortage of actresses. Because my friend Michael Schaefer, who was a bellboy at the Ramada Inn, said he saw Ava Kabor eating at Cyrano's. Because it's a wonderland of space, and they just need, I think we just need a lot of very talented people to fill it up. I think it's the most beautiful urban environment in all the United States. Well, what about the earthquake? This is where it's at. I like the lifestyle. I like to throw frisbees. I like the weather. I like to drive cabs. And I like the people I've met here. And I like to go to the beach. You know, the things that you wind up doing a lot of in Los Angeles. I like living here because I can get out of it a lot. It's close to San Diego. And go to a lot of nice places. It's close to San Luis Obispo. The sky is blue most of the time. You can see the air. On a bad, smoggy day, forget it. I I'm quite hooked on the smog, in fact. I said I would never come here, and here I am. I'd like to talk about my mom and dad. 
Gee, I hope this gets on so they can see me here. They'd really be proud. My family initially uh, resisted what I do, uh, real strongly, as a matter of fact. They gave me all kinds of lessons when I was younger to develop myself, singing, dancing, whatever, and, but that was just to become a well-rounded person. God forbid I should ever get involved in the business. They were very subtle. They would uh, call up and say, how's California? Have you taken your law boards yet? Why don't you become a doctor, a lawyer, a, a teacher, something that's, that's respectable, something that's, that's secure? Why don't you get some teaching credits to fall back on? Every year he comes out to visit me with a new occupation he thinks I should go into. My grandmother thought I should get a job as a grocery clerk. I was going to be a lawyer, and they said, terrific. And uh, where I wound up is certainly not in that direction unless I happen to get a series where I play a doctor or a lawyer and then, Dad, I hope you're very happy. And then I decided, no, I'm going to be an actress. They all threw up their hands and said, oh, you're crazy. And I said, look, that's enough. This is what I want to do. You like it or you don't like it. Give them two choices. Say, I either want to go into show business or change my sex. They always choose show business. Everything bad you can think about it, they thought about it. They related it to all the kind of grosser things in life. You know, the business has a sort of connotation of, oh, you're going to be in show business. What show business? You know, only tramps are in show business, especially being a nice Jewish girl from Cleveland. I think at first they thought it was the old actress, huh? <laughs> Hooker. When I left the ministry and went off into acting, it was a gas because I got excommunicated from the church. You know, they said, my mother said, hey, boy, what are you doing? You know, you're going out into the world of sin and the world of this and that and the other. And I said, hey, look, Mom, I'm doing this all right. My father uh, is an admiral in the United States Navy. And uh, rock and roll people and uh, admirals in the Navy don't mix too well. My parents absolutely would have nothing to do with it. An architect, a lawyer, am I crazy? You are going to acting school and you are going to become a famous actor. That's what they tell me. Oh, now you want me to tell you the truth? <laughs> And, you know, my mom sat there and she said, that's my son, that's my son. Um, of course, I had, it was a scene that I had no clothes on. Of course, she's got up screaming, that's not my son, that's not my son. And they came backstage and my father's response was, how long is it going to take you to get out of that makeup so we can go eat? And my mother said, when are you going to finish with all this and get married? And they thought, well, this is what an actor is going to be. It's a bum job. Because that's really what they think you are. They think you're a bum. But now, years later, they said, that's our boy. We see him on television. And all of a sudden, it was, <gasps> my son, the star. When I did The Tonight Show, Johnny was sick that night, and Ed hosted. It was a last-minute thing. And I remember calling my mother right after the show, and I said, uh, Mama, how'd I do, you know? And she said, oh, honey, you know how I feel about Johnny. When he's not on, I just don't watch. My mother writes me letters every now and then saying, well, I hope things are going well for you. Remember, you can always come home. When I go out on an interview, I'm a nobody. But when I call my mom, I'm a star. They're very supportive about it. They think it's a wonderful thing to be now. I think my parents are just waiting for the day when they can walk into the store and buy the record. They do want to see me uh, make it before they pass away, and I don't want them to pass away, of course. But, um, Mom and Dad, I love you. Got no direction to lose here. Only hurts when I let in. Why don't you take down this number, dear? Try not to Okay, you want to talk about my perfect timing? I came out to Los Angeles about eight years ago. I thought about moving to L.A. for about three years, and just didn't feel right. If any of you out there in documentary land uh, want to know about it, and you're in the record business, I've actually only been out here for about three weeks. And everybody kept saying, oh, come on out, come on out. There's so much happening out here. That's what you must tell these people, because they figure if you've been out here eight years, People have passed you by. And I thought about it, and I thought, nah, not yet. I'll know. They tend to want to think that they've discovered you. And all of a sudden, last May, it just happened. I knew. You tell them, I just came out from New York, 
Hey, talk about the ride a little bit. So I packed up everything, and I came out to, uh, well, first I went home to visit my folks in New Orleans, and then I came out to Los Angeles. Check out the weather in a few places so you can throw in some temperatures and stuff like that to make it look like you just drove across country. And they had been looking for the girl for two years, and sure enough, I got it. And then you can be a pop star. I feel so sorry for the young people starting out in this business because the competition is so great. A lot of people who come here expect to come here and uh, be Doris Day or John Wayne, and uh, it takes a lot of work. When I started at uh, the age of 57, I didn't have that problem because there are not that many old dolls working. I'm not exactly sure um, how you become a star. I was in my little waiter uniform with the gold shirt and the little pants and everything. I don't know what it takes. I don't know if it's um, luck or if it's talent. They introduced me and they just said, this is Harvey Lewis. Uh, he's a, a friend of mine. He's a waiter at Hamburger Hamlet like I used to be. The thing that I do know, the, the most that I can put into anything is my full commitment. So she said, just a minute. And she left the room and she came back and she said, I've just been trying to call the director of this film we're casting. Because if it's going to be luck, it's, it's going to happen anyway. So I went on Wednesday, and I auditioned. I was scared to death. So if it's going to be timing, it's going to happen anyway. And they came running through the courtyard screaming, you got it, you got it. I've got to make the full commitment. With the thing that had happened to me, she says, I haven't heard anything like this since Lana Turner at Schwab's. And if that's the way you really get discovered, sitting at a counter at a drugstore in a sweater, I'm going to commit to that fully and wear every single sweater I've got to every lunch counter in town every day of the week. No other job or profession that I can think of the people are in, they, do they have to worry about every day trying to get the job? He kisses me and then he immediately says, and no, I'm not promising you a job. And I'm saying, well, why not? Why not? Why not? Why can't you just tell me? That is the job, trying to find the job. You're an actress. Your job is to ask for jobs, to insist upon jobs, to beg for jobs. He said, no, I'm a director, right? My job is to uh, tell you that I'll let you know sometime. There's really only one way to get any kind of a job. It doesn't really matter if it's acting or any, anything else. It's just how willing are you to put yourself out on the line? You have to play the game. I'm not going to lose myself in it, but I know what has to be done. You've got to go out and show the stuff. And you can't be insensitive about it. Because if you're insensitive about it, after two demonstrations, you're going to go home and figure out whether or not you're going to use the 38 in the desk drawer or the hose downstairs on the exhaust pipe to call it a day. I played this through a hundred times. I think I play it well. There might be something to it, but it's much too soon to tell. impression of L.A. as, say, from an airplane is a lot like the uh, Inferno by Dante. I took a plane the first time I'd have e I ever flown, and I got sick because it was the first time and I was nervous by myself. I, I wasn't even 21 yet, moving out to California. The idea that propels me there is that there are concentric circles of activity here in town all the way up to the penultimate, that which goes in the Midnight Express and People magazine and so forth, all the way out to the people in the little theater groups who are struggling along, trying to get an agent, trying to get seen, and so forth. And you suddenly see the Hollywood sign. It was just unbelievable for me in these mountains. It was so different from Gary, which the, the factories and the, the smoke in the sky read at night. And it seems as though there are certain levels of punishment and sort of things that you're up to your waist to in, in order to get from ring to ring. I was just so sick and I wanted to bury my head, but I made myself pop up my head because I thought for sure I was going to see movie stars. I thought for sure that I, I was going to see Marlo Thomas. The first day I was riding around L.A., I knew something was different. I was trying to figure out what it was. I realized that all over L.A. you see Rolls Royces. And she said, but what, what do you think about this place, this sprawl, this uh, eternal suburb, this white, hot heat? I'm riding around, and I decide I'm going to count Rolls Royces, right? That even gets to be dull, right? Counting Mercedes gets to be dull. Counting Jaguars gets to be dull. What do you think about palm trees? And I said, oh, I think palm trees are pretty nice. Uh, I like the little squat ones with the big, with the big leaves, uh, as opposed to those long ones with the little tufts at the top, they have little 
tufts at the top. The nice thing is that the money is there. You see it, and people are actually in these cars, and you look in them, and some of them are very young. Some of them are not so young, and that's okay, too. And she said, oh, be I hate palm trees. I don't like palm trees. They have rats in them. I followed this one car, and it turned into this driveway, and there were three other Rolls Royces sitting there. Woman gets out of the car with groceries. I mean, just, you know, something as mundane as groceries. I guess it's six, one half dozen of the other. I mean, they live in palm trees here, and they live in the garbage in New York. People always talk about Los Angeles as being a horrible city. One of my biggest problems here is that I don't think I'm very uh, laid back or mellow. I like L.A. I really like L.A. And if it's a horrible city, that's because of the vibrations that you're putting out. I put out nothing but positive vibrations, and that's all I get back. It's like constant vacation time. And uh, I hate tennis. <laughs> I hate bean sprouts. I tried to like them. I don't. I mean, I do like salad, but it's just not really a meal. It's a bit bizarre coming from the Midwest, but I think I'm able to cope with it. And I love Los Angeles. As a matter of fact, I love any place I have ever been, because I am there. And I make happiness wherever I go. It's very much, um, based here on the first impression. How you look, how neat your hair is, and everything, and hi, my name is Bob, I'll be your waiter, and that's about it. And I'll stay. I'll stay as long as it's necessary to get where I want to go. There'll be no more winters in the freezing cold. Gonna try myself a different kind of snow. Be a leading lady, drive a chocolate brown. Round up all the latest fashion down on rodeo in Sunset City, city by the sea. Sunset City, be what you want to be. Action. Finding work in Hollywood. There are a lot of papers that you read. Mostly they don't have casting calls, and if they do, they've usually been cast two or three weeks in advance. I myself found that the best way to find work is to call everybody I know. I use my telephone, and I use it every day, all day. There are some uh, 16,000 actors in L.A., all of whom go are going after the same thing, and you have to find a way to just kind of uh, put yourself out of the fish pond. I'd be silly and would probably regret it later if I didn't take at least six months or some time period to... to do L.A. in the L.A. fashion. The billboard was a way in which I could create a larger-than-life image uh, in a strategic location and uh, hope that the right people would see it. Taking 60% of your time with marketing and perhaps 20% of your time actually functioning and doing your work. I resorted to a postcard, a picture of me, which was taken from an 8x10 and reduced to 3x5 card with my name on the bottom and the telephone number of my service. That's what I'm going to do now. Go to market. That's what L.A. is all about, unfortunately. My picture must have gone across the desk of a casting agent at the very right moment because they called my agent and asked for my services. And I got an agent right away. He came backstage and wanted me, and I was like 19. And we did a lot of... Um, teenage parts, and then he passed away, and I really wasn't bright enough or intelligent enough to go out and find another agent. So as time went on, I got together with another man, and then he passed away. I have nothing but good things to say about my manager. She's fabulous. She is almost in the same position I'm in. She's just starting out. I'm starting out. She's kept me alive for two years, supported me, formed a record company for me. We're working together. When I hear of something, I, I call her up. And I let her know, and she says, yes, I've heard about that, I submitted you, or no, I didn't hear about that. Let's me do anything I want. It's fired three bands for me. I never have to do it. We work together, because that's what, the, that's what the relationship is. I am working for an agent. My agent is working for me. She's going to make money from what I do. And uh, in other words, it's mutual interest. It's kind of a give and take situation. I give and they take. Betting on my money And I don't expect to win It could be it's my destiny Or just the mood I'm in And I'm having trouble seeing What's right before my eyes I'm waiting for the winter Just to take me by surprise And I'd like to play it your way 
way Cause it's easier than mine You could have lots to show me But I may not have the time I'd love to play it your way Brown rice, short grain, long grain variety. Drugs. Uh, Natural juices, apple. Drugs seem to be synonymous with music. Pineapple, coconut. And so if all of your uh, musician friends, especially the older guys, are getting stoned and stuff, you want to be a part because you want to be as good as them. Fresh squeezed orange juice. I didn't really know, you know if it was good or bad. I just knew it was hip. Tomatoes. But then one day, somebody that I really respected, uh, a really good musician, uh, walked up to me in the uh, parking lot of the musician's union. Carrots. And said to me, he said, I know you're just out here, and now you're going to become really successful, or you're going to become involved in this scene. Celery. The biggest danger that's for you is cocaine. He said, watch out for it, stay away from it. Cauliflower. And I said to him, you know, naturally, I said, oh, huh? I wouldn't get involved with that. There's no problem. Soybeans. And uh, he looked at me really seriously, and he laughed, and he said, uh, that's what they all say. Broccoli. I'm just glad that, uh, that I missed that, because I've seen it ruin a lot of really good musicians. Soups that are already prepared by natural process. Subud, macrobiotics. Minestrone. Scream therapy. Meatless variety, of course. Dream therapy. Natural muffins. Est, pest. Uh, that, I don't know if you know about pest. It's where you have a little Jewish Jiminy Cricket that sits on your shoulder by the name of Elaine Pincus that is constantly saying things like, be yourself, be yourself, be yourself. <laughs> Brand muffins. Everybody's dressed in flimsy things. I mean, everybody relates in a much more uh, tactile, sexual way. And uh, different types of breads. Everybody's into their bodies, you know, and is, I, I, not quite into my body. I always wear the layered look. Bananas. Everybody's, you know, showing off their bodies. It has to do with the climate. It's warm. I mean, there are no changes of seasons. Oranges. Well, when I get up every morning, I do a little bit of each one of the techniques I learn. Like, I'll stand on my head for 20 minutes. I'll do joy breathing. I'll salute the angel of the air, earth, fire, and water. I'll say goodbye to the moon in 30 languages, hello to the sun in 40. The only problem is by the time I'm finished my morning meditation, it's 9 o'clock at night. Gonna join a spa and run six miles a day. Collect antiques and outrageous things to say. Vegetables and protein drinks to keep me I didn't hear anybody say action. Action. OK. Well, <laughs> musicians do a lot of weird things when they're not doing music. You can't always make a living at it. And uh, some of the things I've done, uh, I've sold accordion lessons to kids. I don't feel proud about it, <laughs> but I've done it. I was taking jobs. I was a tour guide at Universal Studios, and then I was a tour guide at NBC, a page. Well, I've gone into people's homes and uh, Told them what a wreck they are and how studying this will certainly help them, and it certainly did, and it paid my rent for a while. I went on my day off to the first audition, and I got a call back. So I decided to go to the call back, and um, I had to call in sick to NBC. And the worst job I ever had was what they call a boiler room. Uh, this is like a phone job. There's 15 or 20 people, each in a little cubicle, and you're on the phone selling stuff to people. And what we sold, oh, this is terrible, <clears throat> was tax-sheltered annuities to teachers. I didn't even really know what it was. And then I got a second call back. And I thought, I can't call in sick two days in a row. I had a very nice job. I'd been working there about three months, and I was doing very well. And then a little, like, a little light in my head flashed, and, and, and a little voice told me, what are you, a page or an actress? And I thought, why are you denying yourself the one challenge in your life that is all you've wanted your whole life. All you've ever wanted your whole life was to be an actor. Uh, I, I really can't do anything else. You know, I mean, I can type three words a week. I, I'm really frightened now because I just gave uh, 
uh, last Friday, I gave a week's notice at my job, and uh, they were all shocked and sort of, oh, don't leave, don't leave, you know. But it's really, really what I want to do. Well, I really find the toughest part seems to be surviving, being able to earn your living until you get the jobs that pay the big money. Um, at the present time, I'm working at 20th Century Fox doing temporary secretarial work. And I really keep hoping that as I roam around there that maybe somebody will spot me and feel that, you know, I'm just right for their production. And I sat there and I watched this one young actress come in. And I looked at her and they just signed her. And I looked at this girl and I thought, I could be doing this. What am I sitting behind this desk for? I should be going on that interview. And it was kind of discouraging, and I found out that Lily Tomlin eats at the Hamburger Hamlet all the time. So naturally, I went and applied for a job. Cher, Diana Ross, Elton John, Linda Ronstadt. Barbara Streisand, uh, uh, Dustin Hoffman, Goldie Hawn, Cary Grant. I mean, the list goes on and on of people who went there. I decided that instead of picking their clothes up off the floor, I'd rather be wearing the clothes or at least working in the industry. And I also was tired of people telling me how adorable horrible I was and that I should do commercials and I decided then I would quit well actually I got fired then from there Winchell's Donut House from uh, 10 at night till 6 in the morning so that I could be fresh as a daisy for interviews in the afternoon which never seemed to come so that job was a waste of time got fired from that because uh, a <laughs> couple of shelves of donuts were missing I'm down to my last dollar my ends don't want to meet My landlord's standing in the door He's pointing to the street I needed a stage name. Sally Raito was just not happening for me. And there's this jazz tune called Nika's Dream, and when I heard it, the name, everything seemed right. I, I felt like it was me I had been looking for for 25 years. So I took Nika as my name, got rid of my last name, and just go by Nika. My name uh, right now is Nicholas Schaefer. And when I came to California from Gary, Indiana, seven years ago, and I first got my agent, um, I was using the name of Snooky Dunovic as my first name out here. Everyone says, like, oh, wow, Hollywood is so phony. Like, everyone changes their name, and, like, there's a bunch of phonies there. Well. Sometimes, uh, we don't want to change our name. You know, of course, I want to know about my acting career, what was in the future for me. And she says, you know, you know, Michael, you're Mars squared to Uranus. And she stopped and she says, did I just call you Michael? And I said, yes. She says, have you ever thought of changing your name? And I said, my name is Carol Ford, and I would like my card, please. And they said, no, you can't have your Screen Actors Guild card under that name because, because somebody has that name. And it was kind of funny because my oldest brother is named Michael and my father's name is Nicholas and I was named after my father and it's usually the eldest son who is named after their father so as a child a lot of times I felt that he should have been Nicholas and I should have been Michael. Well my full name is Mary Carol Lee Ford so I tried Carol Ford, I tried Mary Ford, I tried Lee Ford, and they would look it up in the files and they say, no, 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 you can't use that name. I actually decided that I would change my first name from uh, 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 Nicholas, which was Snooky, then Nick, now to Michael. But of course I needed a, a new last name. So he said, well, how about uh, Vicky, Victoria? You look like a Victoria, try that. And I remember uh, when I was in grade school, I knew a, a Mark Schaefer and a Nancy Schaefer, and for some reason it just ticked off, and I loved the name Schaefer. They looked that up in the files, they said, no, there is a Victoria Ford. So then I called home and said, hello, Mom, I've changed my name to Michael Schaefer. I'll use Carol, my first name, as my last name. Do you have uh, Victoria Carol? They said, no, we don't. And I said, that's it. Do you have to change it to Michael? She says, uh, I'll get you confused with your older brother. September 9th, 1975, I named myself Catlin Adams. She says, well, how about the name Eric Wilson? She had heard a name Erica Wilson on TV, and she thought Eric Wilson would be all right. And I says, well, Mom, I, I really think Michael Schaefer, I mean, I've already changed the bank book and the ID and everything. My real name is Nira Baharav. The way you say that in English is Nira Barab. Well, I thought that no one had a better name than I did. And I would never, ever change it as an actress. Suddenly, I thought, gosh, Michael's not such a special name. After all, there's just so many Michaels. Nira, it sounds like some exotic fruit. And so that's what everybody thought when I walked into their office. What is a Nira Barab? I went home from class that day 
with uh, uh, this wonderful feeling uh, of what the work I had done and the name Nicholas just ringing in my ears. So I decided I'm going to do it. I am going to change my name back to Nicholas. It was Marlena until 1970. I went into a, a spiritual organization, which was the cheapest form of therapy available at the time. And all you had to do to get in there was give them your car and change your name. But numerology-wise, I thought, oh boy, Nicholas is now a, a new number, so I'm going to have to change my last name. They said, no, take the name Lotus, because it's a very ancient, mystical name. Numerologically, it checks out. It's great. And you'll get new vibes, a whole new sense of yourself. And I just start looking up all these people's names at random, and got this little computer out, and find out if there was like some number that they were all coming to. So I took uh, Woody Allen, number nine, Diane Keaton, number nine, Vanessa Redgrave, number nine, Richard Dreyfuss, number nine, Jason Robarts, number one. But I thought, well, number nine must mean something special. I'm going to be a number nine name now. My full name is Colleen Mary Teresa Vieter Cinebali. And about a year ago, I mean, none of those names ever made it. And I found out that uh, Schaefer could be spelled S-H-A-F-F-E-R, and with Nicholas, would make me a number nine name. And I, I think Schaefer spelled that way is a really strong way to spell it. I was once Colleen Vieter, that didn't make it. I tried Mary Vieter, that didn't make it. But I just thought, well, maybe if you spell it that way, people will pronounce it Schaefer instead of Schaefer. So I went to the phone book and looked up all the people with S-H-A-F-F-E-R, and I called them up at random, and I, and I said, Hello, I'm a student at UCLA, and I'm taking a poll on the way uh, people pronounce their name. Do you pronounce your name Schaffer or Schaefer? And like three-fourths of them said Schaefer. So I thought, oh, that's wonderful. And of course, one lady says, I'm sorry, we don't give out any information over the phone. Then I thought of my last name. I said, ah, Vida, 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 Vida means life. So that's what happened, and so that's my name. And they all had the same reaction when I would tell them. I said, my, my name's now Nicholas, and they would all go, Every single person would go that way. And of course, I called home, and, and my mother was quite happy. Something in the air, early in the morning, you could feel it there. This fragrant autumn day, something in the wind lifts me off my feet into a tailspin and steals my breath away. What kind of music do I do? I do uh, urban rock and roll. Urban rock and roll with an R&B bass. It's uh, about desperate characters. I had a band about two months ago. I had an incredible band, incredible drummer. And things were just starting to take off. Articulate music. It's uh, trying to leave people with some kind of hope, you know, even if there isn't any. And then all of a sudden, you know, the calls start coming in and First, the drummer goes, incredible gig with someone I will not name. <laughs> and then somebody else called the guitarist. And then the band uh, had to let go of the piano player. And then the bass player goes off to New York. And then I'm like stuck in my living room again saying, God, what happened? And uh, try to give them some sense of catharsis when it's all over with. You know, and I think maybe I'm a masochist. You know, I just keep getting this dream band together, getting out there and starting to get the gigs, and then the band falls apart, and then I do it again. And you say, why in the heck do I do this to myself every opportunity I get? I mean, why would anybody want to do this to themselves? And then you sort of go, oh, take a deep breath, and you walk out to the stage. And four bars from the first song, you know the answer. To be able to go in front of an audience and to sing and dance gets me excited. And in return, I can relate to the audience and get them excited. And so it circumvents, and it's really a pleasure. I'm still yours, working lonely nights, singing for my supper under glaring lights. It isn't easy, baby. The distance knows no cures, so don't forget about me. Cause I'm still yours. So headset over here on, open? Yeah. yeah. All right, okay, let's keep rolling. Ready? 
action. The first thing people do is they say to you, oh, well, you're here in Los Angeles, you should get yourself a commercial agent immediately and do some commercials, you'll have residuals, you'll be able to live on your residuals. If it's good enough for Henry Fonda and Samantha Egger, I can do it too. My mother could do a commercial, see, anybody could do a commercial, you could get your pet to do a commercial because it's just selling a product. People would say, well, don't you have any scruples? I mean, the artist in you, did you train and do all that work so you could sell deodorant? Is that what it's about? I said, I'd sell cancer if they gave me the opportunity, and I can do it, too. Personally, um, I haven't needed the money yet to do it. And um, I haven't needed the money to do a porno film either. So it's the same thing. I have my scruples with commercials, but they pay so good. How could you say, you know, no, just blank out no. All actors need to work, and they like to make commercials, and. Uh, because they like to get residuals and uh, it pays the bills. That's the thing. That's why I do go out and work temporary jobs and stuff sometimes because I, the rent has to be paid. I've got to keep my car running because if it doesn't run, you can't go out on an interviews. Everything in LA is uh, 200 dry cleaners and a pup and taco apart. I mean, you have to drive forever. It's the only place I've ever been in where the dashboard of my car is my best friend. Well, I've gone through about six or seven cars so far in LA all heaps of garbage. My first two cars, <clears throat> pardon me, got in car accidents. The other ones got stolen. The only thing I don't like about California is the transportation system. I, I don't have a car, so I have to ride the RTD all the time, and it's very difficult. Ooh, and the rush I got as sunlight hit the parking lot. I saw the weakness in my knees. And I know you felt it too. Special in the breeze, something in the air. Okay. Hardest thing for me to get used to was we I'm sorry, can you start again, please? Sure. My fault. There you go. The hardest thing for me to get used to uh, in being an actress or trying to be an actress in Hollywood is rejection. Every day in this business, your life is based on somebody else judging you and somebody else looking at you as a commodity and deciding what your fate's going to be. It usually meant for me when I didn't get a part, a couple of cream pies and a pound of pasta. You don't know why you're being rejected. If somebody sees you today in a blue dress and they wanted a girl in a red dress, that may be the reason. You could go into a publisher's office and he's not feeling well that day, or a song you're singing reminds him of a bad experience he had. You might remind a casting director of his sister-in-law, who he happens to hate. Maybe it's the person that day is shopping for uh, apples and, and you are bringing them oranges. 95% of the times, you might not get the part. It has nothing to do with you. You should never take it personal. Who does it have to do with if it doesn't have to do with me? I mean, we walk in and this is what we're selling. And it's very difficult sometimes when people say, no, you're not right, or no, 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 no. It's very hard not to say, my God, what's the matter with me? Uh, what's wrong? There's zillions of actors and actresses, young, old, uh, ones that, that look like you that you don't even believe there could be somebody that looks like you. So they don't need you. I have a problem with casting. Well, casting has a problem with me. For some reason, a lot of times I miss out on parts because I got green eyes and curly hair, and they ask me what I am. Who am I really? I'm uh, an Arab. How do you do? Uh, my name is Sophia Lindemann. Caramba, you got no madre. Vamos a pedir cabrón. Pese loco. No traes pisto ese. Um, hi. How are you? Talk English. Of course I do, but I don't dwell on it now. <laughs> I really believe in, in the principle that, um, that to get a part, you have to be the part. I walked in, cordial, nice, hello, how are you? And I knew right then and there that I was not what they wanted. And so I try as much as I can when I walk into a casting director's office to be the character they're looking for. As far as I'm concerned, there are certain things that I cannot do. I am not going to pretend to try and get a role as a six foot five, blonde haired, blue eyed basketball player. Many casting directors don't have a lot of imagination. I mean, uh, I sometimes fib about my age. 30 <coughs> years. Because. They want somebody who's necessarily younger, and I can perhaps look younger and play that role. I'm now in my middle 30s. I like to think of it as still middle. But if I told them how old I was, they'd say, oh, he could never play this. I simply don't look my age. Um, I just had my 41st birthday. Surprise. So if I'm years old, 
and I'm called on to play somebody who's mm -mm years old, I say mm -mm years old. That's how old I am. According to current concepts of casting, 41 means you have to have gray hair if you're a man, uh, blue hair if you're a lady, and preferably glasses. They cast according to type. If they want uh, an old southern redneck, they really go out and look for an old southern redneck. Here they start with the appearance and then worry about whether they can act. For instance, I will go on an interview and someone will just take one look at me before I've even done anything and say, uh, sorry, we've already cast the part of Juan. They, they already know what they want, and usually they don't want me. You gotta hang on to the dream we had to pull us through when the times were bad. Don't desert a winning team. You gotta hang on, hang on to the dream. Action. Um, casting couch, okay. Um, of course there exists a casting couch. I know that it happens in every business, secretaries trying to make it to the top and executives trying to make it to the top. I think it exists, the casting couch, for people who are semi-talented or don't have enough credibility in their belief and their talent where they feel, well, I have to compensate. I, I really want the part. In the acting business, it just seems to be expected. They know right away if you're good or you're bad. So if you're bad, they probably want to bed you immediately because it's a good idea. Well, we'll get something out of this person. I uh, never really think about the casting couch because I don't think of myself as, as being attractive in that way. I don't see myself as a, as a hunk. I'm just a nice, sweet boy who uh, may or may not be you know, useful as he matures. I also think that it exists in a lot of actors' heads of the casting couch because it makes acting much more glamorous. Someone once asked me if I thought that there was a casting couch in Hollywood. And I said, yes. I only wish I could find it. Well, all of a sudden, he, he kind of jumps at me and, and grabs my waist. I mean, grabs my waist. And uh, I kind of broke away. I was uh, virtuous and scared. And he was very big and brawny and loud and wrinkly. I told them I sleep with them all. You know, the cameraman, still photographer at the grip. I can't take any chances. I can't leave any stones unturned. As we're running around the desk, he's got my skirt and he's pulling me back. And he asks me, do you have any film on you? Like this. When it happened to me, I spoiled it. I couldn't believe it and I just laughed. <laughs> I don't think he... Well, that's why I didn't get the job. And then he said, do you mind nudity? I said, well, I didn't think there was any nudity in this job. He says, we can work it out. So I just asked to be excused, kind of, and left him at the door, got the job, kept my clothes on. I'm still yours, crazy as it seems. You're still my sweetheart, the hero of my dreams. We live on different oceans, we walk on distant shores, but I'm still mad about you. And I'm still yours. Hi again. What are we talking about? What? We're talking about contacts. The name of the game. Contacts, the name of the game in L.A. In New York, you go to an office to make a deal. And in L.A., you either go to lunch or you go to a party. A lot of business is really taking place uh, in people's houses and around pools. I met the director of this project at a party. It always works like that. And I finally met my uh, biggest connection at the uh, Rainbow parking lot. The Rainbow parking lot's this real hip place where all, like, trendy people in Hollywood get up and they wear all these heavy heels and stuff like that. And, take one another home and take quaaludes and stuff like that. So I figured, being a sensitive songwriter, that's where I belong. Because that's the kind of town it is. It's really important to get things rolling on a social level. And I didn't do that for a long time when I was here because I thought it was really dumb. But it's important and it isn't dumb. So I went over to the guy and I tugged on his shirt and said, here I am, you know? And uh, he had just done a record with Helen Reddy and um, being a sensitive singer-songwriter, I whipped out my guitar and played my tunes, and I got my first connection. And so far, it's been downhill from there. 
First, I'd like to be a movie star. First, I, sorry, you didn't give me the action cue. Go. Um, first, I'd like to be a movie star. Then I'd like to be a director. Then an architect and then a senator. No, I'd like to be. I'm going to be those things. My master plan is stage one, I'd like to make it as a film star or television star. Secondly, move into variety entertainment with one woman show in Vegas for a while. And stage three, I'd like to retire with my own talk show. I really believe that uh, everybody has one destiny. And when you suddenly realize what it's going to be, it's usually, <laughs> it's usually a big surprise. What is my goal? I want to be a star. It's as simple as that. I know what it entails, a lot of hard work, but I'm being honest. I want to have control over my career. And uh, in order to do this, you really have to have power. And I think actors and actresses should stand up and say, I want to be a star and I'm proud of it. If they can't say that, I don't think they're honest and I don't think they should be in the profession. But you have to, to be box office anyway, so that people, people want to see you because that's what gives you the power. The only thing that separates those of us who don't have the money from those of us that do is, it seems to me, the determination just to go out and get it. I felt television was the perfect place for me. I felt that this would be the easiest way for me to achieve the power that I need to control my career. And I'm willing to work hard, but I want the money, too. I want the money that goes along with it. I really, God, I love money. See, my goal early, I had a goal to prove that not all Jews could make money. And uh, I've, I've successfully uh, proven that goal, and I'm now moving on. I want to be able to do my work and write my songs and uh, compose whatever I want to do on my own time. And if I find that I can't do that here in L.A. because of the way things are set up in the industry, I'll just uh, move to Vermont and write my songs there. Well, my next goal is to actually be uh, an actor, and if, even if it's an unemployed actor. So I quit my job as a waiter, and I went down to unemployment, and uh, I went down there to be an unemployed actor. But unfortunately, uh, they have me labeled as a waiter, and I, I tried to explain, explain to the lady that I did not come to California from Indiana to be a waiter but she insists that, that that's what I can do. Sunset City, city by the sea. Sunset City, be what you want to be. And when the hard day's work is done, there's good, clean fun for everyone. In Sunset City, la, 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 la. Well, I'd like to invite you to a costume party. Uh, these are some of the roles that I've played, and I thought you might be interested in seeing, you know, some of the different things I've done. This is from The Tempest. I played Ariel. She was the spirit kind of thing. And I'm reading the entire script. I can't find my part. And I go through it again, and there it is on the first page. The doctor says to the nurse, how much blood has he had? And the nurse says, 10 units. That's it. That's the only thing I had to do. Now, this beautiful gown was worn by Valeria in Shakespeare's Coriolanus. And she was the butterfly of the court. I said to her, I only have two words to say, and it's going to be under a surgical gown. Why am I here for two and a half hours trying on four different bras? And she said, in this business, you know, tomorrow you could be a star. Everybody's important. And this one is Marina. And she was the princess daughter of Pericles, and that had a happy ending. She said, now I'm going to call a limousine to take you down to the set. I said, the set's a block away. She said, well, we'll call the limousine anyway. I said, I understand. I might get too tired to say my 10 units by the time I got there. You better get the car. This was in Blanche Dubois in Streetcar. Uh, Blanche went to the party, and she was also 
Very southern. I'm there the entire day being fitted and made up and the whole thing, and they never got to the shot. I love Blanche. She, uh, she was wonderful like everybody is, but circumstances like took over her and uh, she got neurotic and psychotic and they took her away and it wasn't the best ending. And by this time, I've been sitting around for three days to say, 10 units. Finally, we get to the take and the director says to the uh, surgeon who's on the set to make sure that everything is, you know, the way it should be, um, what would, um, what is the, what would the nurse say in this kind of an operation? Give her some, something to say. And this is Virginia Woolf. Who's afraid of Virginia Woolf? And she was much more than an alcoholic. And the doctor says, well, she could say, he's had five units, he's on his six, we've got two waiting. And I looked at the director and I said, thank you so much. I said, there's a, a verb in that sentence which makes it a line. And I love Virginia Woolf very much. In fact, I love all my girls. I really take a personal um, feeling to all of the parts that I play. Oh, hero, please come to the rescue. She sits at the edge of her seat. Oh, that's my light on the screen. Are you thinking of coming to Hollywood? Well, think about it a little longer. Don't come in half cocky thinking that, well, I'm gonna put the world on its ears and in six months and whatever. I mean, I've been doing it for 15 years. Be prepared to stay. Because it frightens people when they see that you're only gonna be here for a short time. Then they don't want to invest in you. And stay. If you stick around and you're good at what you do, sooner or later, you're gonna be a success. Um, overnight success, they call it. You know, that's a really a long night. If you're planning to come to Hollywood and be a rock star, remember that's what Charlie Manson was planning to. Don't move to L.A. Don't, unless you wanna be lied on, cheated about, cheated, talked about, mistreated, abused, rejected. Don't come until you know you can do it. You may not get work, but do it. Go out of your way to do it any way that you can. And if you don't get work, you're not doing it. If you can do anything else, do it. A word of the wise is don't. But if you, if, I, if you can take that advice and don't, and you still do, then you, you know, you probably make it. It's really important that you know as much as you possibly can know before you get here, so you're not duped. If you get an idea, for example, uh, here, you should never tell it to a middle-aged man with white hair and an open shirt with a gold chain. Um, he will steal it from you without question. And don't believe anything until you see it in action, because a lot of people talk. And as a word of advice to all of those who will come after me, is take yourself very, very seriously at all times, because behind every dark cloud, there is a silver lining. And uh, nothing here makes any sense. And if you try and make sense out of it, you will get as crazy as everybody else here. Crazy neurotic, everybody's crazy and neurotic. It's like, you know, I'm crazy and neurotic too, but I don't want to be crazy and neurotic. So, um, I guess that says a lot about L.A. Ooh, when the air is calm and you need a breeze That's the time to take a walk by the sea Just lie on the sand so at ease See, yes, the time Hi, my name is Catlin Adams. I'm an actress and a filmmaker. Mare Ayers, and I'm an actress. Corey Bishop, songwriter. Randy Bishop, and I'm a singer and a songwriter. Anna Bogdanovich. My name is Anthony Bruno, and I'm a writer, actor, singer, dancer, waiter, maitre d'. What is my profession? I'm an actor in Los Angeles. My name is Vincent Caristi. I love to write music. I write music. I'm Alan Caro, and, uh... I like to think of myself as a closet movie star. Victoria Carroll, and I'm an actress. My birth certificate says Len H. Chandler, Jr. Thank you, Father. Um, I'm a songwriter. Nikki Cohn, 
actor. Sarah DeWitt, and I bill myself very informally, because the newspapers have done so, as the uncommon lady from El Segundo. Jeff Doucette, I'm an actor, a comedian, a writer, a philosopher, and a wild animal trainer. Sherry Eichen, entertainer. I'm Mike Farrow, actor, funny musician. David Fisher, I'm a singer and a composer. Ginger Flick, and I'm an actress. Barbara Gannon, I'm an actress. Mitch Genunzio, and I'm an actor and a writer. Peter Glendeman, I'm a guitar player and a fantasy maker. The name is Rich Goldman. The name remains the same. Uh, songwriter. Marty Gwynn, and my profession is I am a singer and a songwriter. Laurie Jacobson, I am an actress slash comedian. I'm Scott Jarvis, and I'm an actor. It's Holly Johnson, and I'm a bound and determined singer, dancer, actress, musician. Tom Johnson, and uh, I'm a sensitive singer, songwriter. Painter, songwriter, uh, script writer. Rala Khan, and I'm a waitress dash actress. Potential director, producer, uh, you name it, actually, and I'll try it. Suzanne Kent, and I'm finally an actress. I'm Zael Kessler. I'm an actor. I'm Nancy Kimberly. I'm an actress, singer, dancer, comedian. Jeffrey Kramer. I'm an actor. Jeremy Lawrence, actor. Peter Lempert, actor. Harvey Lewis, and I'm an actor. Clyde Lieberman, and I'm a musician and a songwriter. Gail Lopata, I'm a singer and a songwriter. I should tell you that my name is Jack Lukes and that I am an actor. Roland Miles, and I'm a vocalist, I'm a songwriter, percussionist, actor, and a dancer. Nika, I'm a jazz flutist. Marjorie A. Patterson, and I'm an actress. Tony Plana, and I'm an actor. Wesley Vern Pritchett, musician, entertainer, professional survivor. Joe Rivello, I'm a songwriter. It's Marianne Sampson, and I'm a commercial actress. Greg Sutton, I'm a recording artist. Henry Sutton, Actor. Sheila Tesler. Show business. That's my life. Philip Michael Thomas. I'm an actor, singer, dancer, communicator, liver of life. Paige Thornton. Acting. Vita. And I'm a singer. Lotus Weinstock. And I'm a comedian. Oliver Woodall. And I'm an actor. I'm Lenore Woodward, an actress. Oh, my name is Nicholas Schaefer. And I'm an actor. I really am. Thank you.